Hi, I'm Sarah Stratton, Reconciliation and Indigenous Justice Animator with the United Church of Canada, and I'm speaking today with Alf Dumont. Um, we're here to talk about his memoir, The Other Side of the River, an honest and at times vulnerable account of his life. Alf, how would you describe yourself to those who are watching or listening to us right now? I'm a man who has journeyed a long journey in life uh, from being born of a Indigenous mother and uh, a father who had Irish and French in him. My mom was also mixed. She had some English as well as her Anishinaabe roots. So uh, um, a man who has struggled with life and a man who has struggled with the different spiritualities from the Wadawi Wynn Lodge to the United Church of Canada and the Christian theology. So You've probably already answered the question, but why did you decide to uh, to write this book? And, and what is it about your own story um, that you think is important to share with others? Each of us has a story uh, deeply inside us. I went through uh, psychoanalysis uh, when I was wrestling uh, back in the 70s, and that helped me even more to understand my own story. I think each of us needs to share our stories with each other as we seek to find reconciliation and new healing within the world, uh, and if we seek to find healing within inside ourselves. I went through many different experiences, being a minister in several different churches across different parts of Canada, and uh, I also, uh, in that journey, recognized that it was really important that all of us share those deep stories with inside ourselves. Healing comes when we do share, and often we are reluctant to share. When I went through all those experiences within the churches and involved in the Jesse Soto Center uh, as it was established and in the All Native Circle Conference, many people said to me, both my elders and people that I worked with, you should share your story. I was reluctant to do that. I was born shy. I hid, uh, for the most part, my life when I was really young because I was hurt. But gradually, with the support of uh, my wife, Barb, and my sons, uh, Dan and Mike, uh, I began to write uh, and begin to listen to those voices that said, share your story. Uh, people need to hear that story. I didn't think they did, but other people did. And I listened as carefully as I could to what they said. And so with the encouragement and support of people around me, uh, maybe over 10 to 15 years, I put together this book. Uh, and uh, it wasn't easy to do. I still have uh, fear uh, in me in terms of how people will receive what stories I have shared. But you share some difficult, you share some difficult stories. I mean, you, you talk about your brother Ralph's death at the age of 15 and, and your feelings of responsibility for that. You talk about um, the, the bullying you experienced as a young boy and how you managed to uh, forgive those who bullied you. Those are, those are hard things to share with, with people that you don't know, but you obviously felt you had, um, you had learned something from them and that we might be able to learn something from those stories as well. It's it's not just a matter of sharing what we think are positive stories. Uh, stories that I shared uh, about the death of my brother and, and the responsibilities that I was given during that time and shared the stories of being bullied uh, by those who also were my friends are stories that need to be heard because all of us have those stories deep inside us. And if we don't share those, we don't really find the healing and cleansing that we need inside ourselves, nor do we encourage others to share their stories, because a lot of people carry a lot of anger. And you see that in some of the things that are happening on the streets these days with protests, that the anger side are the stories that we haven't shared of us being hurt and us wanting to get back at some of those who hurt us or at the institutions that hurt us. But the healing comes when we're able to share with each other. And I hear your story of pain, 
you hear my story of pain and we find places of identity. And I've done that with uh, years in the church and counseling and counseling with the uh, First Nations people that came into ministry and were wrestling with areas of ministry. And, and we talked in circles, uh, uh, those circle talks. So we went around mm -hmm. the circle time and time again, each of us finding ways of sharing our story and therefore finding healing. Healing comes only when we're willing to do that. So that's why I was pushed to write the book, but also inside me, I felt it is right. I need to share that because people need to be encouraged to share their story just as I have shared mine. You tell a, you tell a really interesting story about a circle in the book uh, when you're working at the psychiatric hospital in Toronto and how you were, no, I think it was a, it was a, it wasn't a psychiatric hospital. I think you were working on a, a ward for folks who were paraplegic and you were in a talking circle with them and some difficult things came up and, and the institution um, shut it down. They shut down the circle because it was too uncomfortable, too difficult. And you kind of lament that and, and think about what, what could it have been if it hadn't been, if it hadn't been shut down and you were disappointed. But I thought what was very interesting was you kind of tucked that away as a learning um, and I'll open up a circle again at another time and maybe it'll be more welcome. Um, and of course that, that did happen um, uh, throughout much of the rest of the book in different circumstances. Just keeping with the storytelling theme for, for a minute, I mean, I know it's really, really important in Anishinaabe tradition, the importance of passing on story. That's how you teach. That's how you learn life's lessons. And you, you give us a lot of those, a lot of those lessons in the book. And as I wrapped up the book last night, it struck me about the first third of the book, speaking very roughly, it seemed like this was st uh, story after story. Um, and the reader is left to sort of contemplate them and think about what might be coming next. And then as you get into the more, uh, uh, you, you go to university, you go to Emmanuel College, you go into a series of jobs, including pastoral jobs, and then um, um, send um, the, the uh, Dr. Jesse Soto Center and All Native Circle Conference. The book becomes more of a traditional narrative at that point, I felt. Um, and kind of moved away from storytelling. And as a white person, I was like, yes, I'm more used to reading something this way. Um, and then by the end, you get more into story again. And I wonder if that was intentional or if it was just a reflection of sort of where you were in life at those, at those moments. I don't know if that occurred to you at all, but it struck me last night. It wasn't done intentionally that way. Um, when I uh, was involved in churches and, and was uh, crafting sermons and talks, they always involved story. But within a story, there's teaching. Uh, Tatanka Hasti, as I said at the beginning of the, of the book, said, take from this what you can, leave the rest behind. In sharing a story, we share teachings and truths. We share the pain that we went through. But when we come to the truth and understanding that's underneath that, then you can articulate that truth more clearly because you understand it as part of a story. Mm -hmm. So stories are very much a part of who I am uh, as a Anishinaabe person, but very much a part of who I am uh, as a, a minister, as a, a director, as a human being. When I went to Emmanuel College and I studied theology, I had studied philosophy and psychology at Laurentian University. In both of those places, what really bothered me and what really I had to wrestle with is that I did not know the stories of those who taught me. I did not know the stories of my professors. I did not know the stories of the principal of the college. Uh, I had to push to find some of those stories and some were willing to share their stories with me. Only when I understood and heard their story could I understand their theology. Because a theology doesn't stand by itself. It is a reflection of where we are on the spiritual journey. 
And that's why I challenged many of the professors at Emmanuel College about what they were teaching. I had to see the truth lived in them and in their story. So that's why there's a mixture. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's some places where it's strictly more like a theological reflection, but it reflects back to the story. That theology is what comes out of me, comes out of my story, even though theoretically I can look at it in a different way. So I've learned from both cultures. Mm -hmm. Now I have to say, um, covers a lot of serious ground, but there's a thread of humor throughout almost everything that you that you write. Um, I sat on the porch when I first began reading it on the weekend. I'm sitting on the porch and I'm just I was literally laughing along, you know, at, as you would um, reflect on your experiences. And they were just little small comments, but I just thought this is a man with a, with a deep sense of humor. Um, and um, you say that humor should be part of what you carry in your bundle, should be part of what guides you through life. And I wonder if you could talk a bit more about the importance of, of humor um, in the Anishinaabe way um, and to you personally. Part of what I gain, and, and pro it wasn't a quote teaching to me in a strict sense, it was watching my mother. Uh, my mother, Sarah, uh, had to leave me in the uh, hospital after I was born. I was, I was in hospital for three months. Um, and then I came back and she, she took me home again. Later in life, when I was around four or five, she had to go into hospital herself because of tuberculosis and was there for a year, a year and a half. When she came through those experiences, she still had her sense of humor. She laughed and was able to look at life in a, in a, in a way that uh, I learned. And so I learned humor. I think my brother learned humor, so did my sister. We learn to laugh uh, because laughter gives you perspective. Laughter also allows you to uh, break free from sometimes the anger and depression you're in and allows you to see it in a different way. So when I uh, see people walking on the streets these days and, and are angry and are shouting, uh, I want them to laugh as well because the laughter then shifts you enough to say, yeah, I, I, I am angry and it's good reason to be angry, but I have to also understand where that anger comes from, how deeply it touches me. And with my laughter, I'm able to lift myself a little bit and move with new insights and new awarenesses. Uh, a lot of my humor comes from puns. My uh, sons get tired of my puns sometimes, uh, but that's part of it, just to see that what you're saying has several different levels of meaning and the humor brings those out. So when I uh, see a pun, I, uh, I say a pun and we all laugh and begin to say, okay, what? What more does that mean? And how does that touch me in a different way? And also the laughter uh, keeps us from taking ourselves too seriously. And my mother never took herself too seriously. She laughed at life and she laughed uh, in a ways. And I share one of those stories in, in there where uh, when she was in uh, the hospital uh, with tuberculosis, she had to go to a general hospital for surgery. And uh, they uh, did surgery that she didn't give permission to because she was not at that level. And they came to tell her about it, but she had always spirit traveled and she knew what. So I could hear her laughing. Just even if she didn't laugh, I could hear her laughing when the doctors came to tell her what they did. Yeah. Uh, they did a hysterectomy. And that would be part of my mother. She would accept it, uh, but she would see that humorous side of it as well. So I think I've inherited that. Uh, and I think that's the Anishinaabe way. That's partly how we survive. We, we're able to laugh at things and give perspective. You don't lose part, you don't lose sight of that part of yourself. That's- No, you don't. A part of who you are and you, and you honor it, right? Right. I, uh, I, I 
one of the funniest things that I read in the book was um, you were, I think, very early at Emanuel and you had written your first essay for your systemic theology course. And the professor wrote on the bottom, this is heresy. It was a one page paper, this is heresy. And your brother, Jim, who was following the traditional path, said to you, oh, are you a heretic now? And you said, no, I'm a pesky little wood tick. And uh, I just thought, oh, he's a punny guy. And, um, but you are like that. You are like that little wood tick, getting underneath the skin, getting in there, put some different thoughts into people. And at that point in the book, you were talking about, um, an issue that's very bothersome for many Christians, the idea that there might not be just one true spiritual approach to life, that there are many valid spiritual paths and, um, and, that, you, uh, and that you have to appreciate and, and respect those. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you wanna say about that at this point. We can probably even come back to it again, but I didn't wanna lose the wood tick joke. Uh, yeah, wood ticks, uh, if, if you grow up in the country as I did, uh, we've met many of them. Uh, one thing about a wood tick is it will bite you. If you don't notice it biting you, it can get under your skin. And then you have to go to a more serious way of trying to remove that wood tick. Um, and yes, I did get under the skin of uh, quite a few of the professors uh, because I wanted to challenge them in the way they were thinking and in the way they were presenting theology. As I said, they didn't share their stories. They didn't share their wrestling. They just said, this was the way you have to understand it. And this is the way you have to approach uh, reading and taking theology. And when you write your paper, you have to reflect some of that learning. But they didn't ac accept my reflection of learning and the fact that I looked at things differently. Uh, and I think my brother had the same difficulty uh, and he was going to leave theology, but he decided, no, he would continue and complete his courses and then move on to where he wanted to in the Medebi win, which was more in what he found sharing a story. Uh, a wood tick is, is uh, an essential creature in life. And sometimes to be a wood tick, uh, you may uh, push people away, but you may also make them aware that they may need to look at life in different ways. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, we laughed a lot about that. It was difficult to have my first essay uh, declared a heresy, uh, but that professor and I had bumped into each other much later in life, and he still had difficulty letting go of his one way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So the wood tick didn't quite get all the way through his skin, but, uh, <laughs> but still had but it's an still impact. There. Still there. <laughs> yeah, now, still there. I'm going to confess something to you. I thought your book was called Two Sides of the River. I don't know where I got that idea, but that's what I thought it was called. And when it arrived on my um, electronic reader last week, I saw that it was called The Other Side of the River. And um, I was intrigued by that because I, I just assumed, I mean, you're talking about different identities in this book, right? Your heritage as uh, Anishinaabe, your European heritage, how you walk both those paths your experience with uh, indigenous uh, spiritualities and your uh, experience within Christianity and, and navigating those, those paths. So I sort of thought it was going along two sides of the river, but instead it's like, well, here I am on this side looking at that side. Um, and so I wonder if you could reflect a little on what you, what you thought about the title um, are you always looking over to the other side? And is, if so, if, is there a tension there or are you, um, how do you come to terms with that? Uh, in some ways I'm on both sides of the river mm -hmm. because I carry uh, heritage from both sides, uh, spiritualities from both sides. But the title has to do with some of those realities we have to face in life where we may see ourselves as somebody who has incorporated understandings from Anishinaabe way and from uh, Christian way, from a Dewiwin way, from uh, Irish culture, from French culture, from English culture, all of which have rich teachings to give. But sometimes we bump up against realities. Uh, 
back uh, over a year ago, uh, my sons and I applied for status. My brothers also applied for status. And you would have thought that uh, that would happen sooner, but because of certain laws and regulations within the country, my grandmother married off the reserve, my mom married off the reserve. It meant that only uh, in the last uh, year or two years have we been able to apply for status. It's when you bump up against those realities within our uh, governmental systems, within our systems uh, in society, where there is uh, that kind of racism that still is there, then you realize, yes, I am standing on one side of the river, looking across to the reserve, looking across to that First Nations community and recognizing, yes, I'm a part of it because they accept us there. Uh, Jim does a lot of ceremonies in that community, but technically I'm not. I'm still mm -hmm. on the other side of the river looking across. Uh, in some ways and sometimes in some places within certain churches, I feel I'm on one side of the river and some of the people listening to me are on the other side and we're shouting at each other, often not hearing each other, but somewhere along the way we have to recognize we each have gifts to offer each other. Uh, and uh, so that's part of the journey. We bump up against uh, realities and those realities test who we are again. So we feel that we can look at one side and we, uh, we know we're on the other side, but part of us feels very much not fully on the other side of the river. But you, um, you, still, um, you still walk with Jim, right? I mean, Jim has been oh, yeah. a really important part of your, of your life. Um, and uh, despite your, or maybe because of your different paths you um you you walk well or you journey well together i think that's what I, the impression i get from from the book i see him there with you in these really important moments um you know his his presence in 1986 in sudbury for the for the apology which came after um years of pressure from the indigenous church that the united church finally responded to that uh, Jim is there with, with the Indigenous Church, and Art Solomon is there with the Indigenous Church, both of them bringing their traditional uh, way to that really important process for us all. I, I don't know if you want to comment any about, about that relationship in particular. It's part of the fact that we are brothers, uh, but also brothers who honoured and respect each other in the ways we would walk in the world. Um, and to know that you are respected and honored and loved by a brother who would sit with you uh, while you were being spit upon, uh, who would shake hands with you in the Cottenham area when I was minister there, and we agreed to honor and respect each other's traditional ways and teachings, and that we would learn as much as we can from each other in those journeys. Uh, Jim doesn't have difficulty accepting uh, some of those teachings that Jesus gave, especially those teachings around love and respect and uh, loving our enemies, loving our friends, loving our neighbors. Uh, how do we then pull together as a community? He has taught in university and he has taught uh, people of different cultures and backgrounds. Uh, and he's worked with his uh, traditional people in the Medewewin Lodge and the traditional teachings of that lodge. But we've always recognized that spirituality is a gift given to each of us uh, as we come into this world, we come into spirit beings to be human beings. Uh, and we honor that and recognize that each of us walks in a little bit of a different way, but we try to hear what each other is saying. Uh, so Jim's uh, support uh, of those teachings helps me to try to respect fully as well, because I was involved in uh, interspirituality uh, discussions, uh, we call them interfaith dialogues, but I think they're interspiritual. It's a wider uh, uh, understanding of that than, than we have given it ourselves, even within the church. And to really respect that, you really have to let go of some of those things that you have held onto, uh, which maybe pull, keeps you back from fully respecting that other person and their journey.
And then part of the respect is that we also have to challenge each other because some of the teachings that we hear from other traditions, we have to challenge and we have to be challenged in some of the things that we hold that keep us back and prevent us from really hearing and honoring that other person. Mm. So hearing, hearing and honoring the other person, I think, um, can bring us back to um, the apology of 1986, um, pretty strongly uh, called for by the Indigenous Church. Um, and then a second apology in 1998. Um, so the first apology around colonization, the second apology in 1998 around uh, residential schools. Um, and, uh, and it's important to note, as you do in the book, that the, the apology of 1986 has never been formally accepted. It's not yet lived out, to, so it can't be accepted. It's, um, it's a, uh, in process. It's been acknowledged, but it's in process. And so the church is still challenged to, to live up to these apologies. Um, and you, in particular, are challenging the church uh, to re-examine its theology. What is the theology that, that allowed the church uh, even though it was, you know, initially uh, a long time ago, um, but it continued for many years, what was the theology that allowed the church to participate in residential schools? You say something very powerful. You say the church can't possibly say that it loved those children, that it that it did these things to, um, and that the church really needs to wrestle with this with this theology um, that justified the schools and that justified. Um, condemning Indigenous spirituality. Can you share with us what you think a, uh, a re-examination or a reflection on that theology could look like? I think it's pieces and parts of the theology that maybe we don't even examine. And, and one of those is that you can only be saved or rescued by Jesus, by mm -hmm. Believing in Jesus in a certain way. I don't even know that that was what Jesus was saying. I don't think Jesus was saying that. Uh, but the writers who follow Jesus put those there and to interpret them in certain ways that there was only one way in which we could relate to God. And that was through Jesus. I think these days we think differently. But we still have to look back at that theology and say, are we still carrying that? Are we still carrying that within our theological schools? Are we still teaching it in the churches where we go? Uh, or are we teaching about Jesus in a different way and some of the ways he taught about love and caring? And are we willing to examine what we do? I think all of us make mistakes in our relationships. Uh, sometimes we're, we have difficulty because we feel we would be rejected or uh, they might get angry at us. Uh, are we willing to love them in a way that we're open to hearing them and their story? Um, so I, I think the theologies sometimes get left out, but we still carry them. And we need to look at those and say, maybe we need to let go of this particular thinking of uh, theology, of, of a theological expression. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life for me means that uh, the I am is also the I am in me. Uh, that I have truth that I carry and that to become one with God as Jesus became one with God uh, is something each of us does because we are spirit and we are connected with spirit and as long as we see ourselves as spiritual beings we are one and we are one with each other uh, those are things we need to look at in different ways there are uh, I, I'm just rediscovering my Anishinaabe language and I don't know too much about it but I hear from other people who are teachers, there are words that are similar in uh, Ojibwe teachings to what are in Christian and even in Hebrew teachings, uh, words that talk about the I am. Uh, and um, I remember my elders saying, that. I didn't totally understand until maybe 10 years later what they were saying, uh, but they were saying that uh, people like Gladys Taylor and, and uh, Edith Memnuk, who Edith was the one who stood up and said, we will not accept the apology, mm -hmm. we will receive it, and we will watch you as you live it out. Uh, and that teaching, I think, is a good teaching. I remember when I asked the, uh, the, uh, the only Circle Conference how I should lead it, because I, uh, we were in this big circle and I wanted their direction. And they said, you go ahead and do it and we will watch you. 
Mm. Well, I think that's part of part of life. Uh, live out you believe. We will watch you, and then we will share with you. And are you willing to be challenged? Are you willing to be open to change, and to change your ways? So I think that's part of the the, the struggle with uh, uh, when we make apologies. Uh, apology is, uh, as my brother reminded me, is some, if I make an apology, I said I've done something wrong, and I'm willing to change my direction. I'm willing to change the way I think and act. Uh, and that's what an apology needs to do. I remember talking to one of the people in the church saying that I believe the first apology was around theology. Uh, and it had to do with how we were willing to change our understanding and our expression of spirituality. That person didn't agree with me. Mm. And that's okay. Uh, we will, we're willing to be friends, but disagree. But I still will challenge that person saying, yes, we need to look at our theology. We need to look at that. And that was what that first apology was about. Deeper than just uh, saying we are sorry that we uh, didn't recognize you. Yeah. We are not who we were meant by God to be. That's a pretty powerful yeah. statement. Yeah. 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 Um, so this, this book is your story. Um, but it's also the story of the Indigenous Church within the United Church of Canada uh, coming into its own in the, or coming to its own in a new way, I should say, in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, you talk about that series of Aboriginal consultations that took place, which you helped staff, um, discussions which led to the apology, uh, creation of All Native Circle Conference, creation of Dr. Jesse Soto and Francis Sandy Centers, which are now the amalgamated um, Sandy Soto Center. You were at the middle of all of this as a staff person. And many of the people uh, who you feature in the book, people like Bernice Soto, Murray Wheatung, Evelyn Broadfoot, Nelson Hart, those are now the elders of, uh, of our new Indigenous church uh, as it seeks its way forward. And you, you kind of live through some of the hopes and dreams um, in that early period. What are your hopes for the Indigenous church today as it moves forward? That they walk in a careful way. They honor their traditional teachings, go back to their elders in a traditional way, hear them, uh, try to honor them in the way they live their spirituality. That the church can be a different place uh, for them uh, and that uh, it doesn't have to be about uh, standing up in the pulpit and preaching. It could be very much a way of sitting in a circle and talking, uh, honoring uh, and, and maybe doing a communion by uh, me taking a glass of wine or grape juice, passing it on to the next person as I would pass on the loaf and they break it off, do it around the circle and come back. There's no, there's no leader. We're all leaders. Yeah walk more humbly with it, to support each other, as I think most First Nations communities do. They, they, they're struggling with survival as well. Most uh, Indigenous communities, uh, as most churches in Canada right now, are struggling with membership and, and how we work together with each other. Not to be afraid to go into the sweat lodge. Uh, I still do the sweat lodge at uh, the British Columbia Institute of Technology. And I work with the elders there uh, as they lead it. I am not a leader in the uh, in the sweat lodge. I only took on so much responsibility. I do not carry the pipe, but I will uh, share the pipe if the pipe is passed to me because that is a sacred thing, as I will share a communion uh, with others who lead in communion. I think we need to find ways of being as open as we can as we hear those things uh, and, and learn. So I think I, I hope that those who are established themselves as leaders in the indigenous community now because those of us who have become elders like Stan and I have to step back and let other people take those roles. Uh, I, I hope there are young people coming up who can see that there is a place for them within the church uh, where they can also honor and, and respect some of those other teachings that they carry from their traditional backgrounds. If, if in those communities uh, they still carry those traditional ways. It's, uh, that is reviving, but it's not in all communities. Mm -hmm. 
you when you talk about um, how you you went into this this work beginning with the consultations and then to um, Dr. Jesse and then to ANCC you you talk about the support you received in doing that from the non-indigenous congregations that you that you were a part of um, and uh, and that that was very that was very uh, important and I wonder what your what your advice to the non-indigenous church is as it seeks to to live alongside uh, this new self-determining indigenous church that that was created and and that's a part of the bigger question of of reconciliation too. What what uh, those of us who are non-indigenous in the church, what what are we called to do in that new relationship, and in working towards reconciliation? Well, if I remember back to the community of Beverly Hills, where I was when I was asked to take on the role of uh, the new role of director of the Dr. Jesse Soda Center, I I went naturally to all the elders and ask them what they would do and when I did that they honored me with their stories. I think non-indigenous community is like indigenous community in the sense that we all have a story and if people share their stories with each other they are much more open to affirming the directions that certain people need to go. I was reluctant to take on the position. Uh, part, of, part of my shyness, part of my not believing in myself, but other people believing in me. And part of it is that I had just come back, Barbara and I had just come back from four months away in Australia doing exchange there. And I felt I needed to commit myself to this church for a longer period of time. But the elders, uh, non-First Nations elders, when they talked to me and told their stories, told of a time when they had to make a decision themselves in their lives and how that decision uh, affected them and made them who they are today. And so they said, no, you need to go ahead. You go ahead and you have our blessing. I think that's the kind of thing that if we're talking about reconciliation as, as non-First Nations people uh, read more and more about First Nations understanding, read books about uh, written by First Nations people about who they are. And as they uh, come up uh, in relationship to First Nations people, meet people, First Nations people, uh, in the natural settings where they are or invite them to come and share uh, from their community into the church, what we need to do is hear each other's story. Uh, not just have somebody get up and make a speech. Do it in a way that we hear the other side of the story. And when we hear that story, we will be changed and we will see them as human beings, as spirit beings who come in to this human world. And we're all carrying things that we need to share with each other. But I think that, that kind of understanding, uh, sometimes we invite uh, First Nations people into the church and they, they get up and they speak and then they leave. Uh, instead of doing that, maybe we should change the church structure when they're there to a big circle, meet in the church hall, and each of us share stories along with that person who shared their story. Kind of like what you've done for us with this book. Yeah. <laughs> Get us into a circle and, uh, and um, shared your story and I think are encouraging us to think about our own. Yeah. I I have, I have one final question and um, I think people um, who are interested in this book will also be interested to hear that you're donating your royalties from this book to the Sandy Soto Spiritual Center. And I wonder if you just wanna speak a, a little bit about why, why you chose that. Partly because uh, the dream of Jesse Soto uh, way back in, in the uh, 70s and 80s was to have a place where First Nations people could study theology, could study spirituality, uh, and to be leaders of their own community. The Sandy Soto Center uh, is a combination of uh, Jesse Soto and Sandy Center, as you had mentioned. Uh, both those centers came together with that same dream of training leadership of Indigenous people in their own communities and for the wider church. I wanted to support that. Um, I've always been taught that you need to give. And in giving, 
It enriches the lives of all people as well as being enriching your own life. You share what you have. So this is my way of sharing with the Jesse Soto Center and the Francis Sandy Center, uh, a way that they can continue on, but that they may also be open to uh, hearing the stories and continue to hearing stories from both uh, the First Nations communities and spiritualities, as well as the non-First Nations uh, communities and their spiritualities, Christianity and traditional ways. And because they both embrace those and they, I know they have a sweat lodge there and they do circle talks, I wanted to encourage that and, and have them continue in that way with the teaching and the, the leadership development uh, that they had there. Thanks for, um, for sharing uh, so generously with us uh, in this interview and, and through the book and through inviting us to, uh, through this book and other ways, uh, join in with the community at, at Sandy Soto. So um, I think that's I think that's a wrap. Okay, Jay McGwitch for uh, doing your job. It was an honor. Enjoy talking to you. You too.